Welcome to another episode of Drew Pavlou's Bolt Cutter. This program is with my mate, Max Mock. We've been to Ukraine together. We've battled against the CCP together. We've run in elections together. And uh, Max, I very much wanted to you to share your story with, uh, with the world. So thank you for coming on the, the show. Thanks for A great friend on. of the show. Uh, Max, okay. <laughs> it, first, yes. Firstly... Uh, the setup. Is, that, is the, that what we're calling it? The bolt cutter? I don't know, to be honest. I, I've, <laughs> uh, I've been changing it around a couple of times. Sometimes I've been calling it bolt cutter. Sometimes you said the Drew Pavlin show. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> basically, the idea is to have the human rights podcast where we're talking about, you know, yeah. all the dictatorships and how we're, all the serious political things. And then I've got like other, other podcasts as well. Of course. Um, firstly, I just was going to say it's a very funny sort of setup because um, with the red curtains behind us and the dingy light, it looks like we're in a kind of like. You know, uh, <laughs> IRA terrorist. You know, you know that. Uh, you know when they were like taking responsibility for the bombings, and they had that video with their, where they're all wearing balaclavas in the in the basement. It, it looks a little bit like this, and perhaps that is actually very. Uh, perhaps that is very appropriate, considering we're both considered terrorists by the Chinese government. Yeah, we'll leave that to um, the audience's imagination. Yes, here, here. Perhaps we can start. So you you were born in Hong Kong. Yes, I was. Yeah, you were born in Hong Kong. Um, but you, were, you had Australian citizenship from birth? Yes, that is correct. Yes, yes. And, and so you spent all your, your early life in Hong Kong and basically you didn't... When was the first time you came to Australia? First time... Well, I've travelled to Australia before, but on a holiday. Yeah. So yeah. I haven't stayed more than two weeks ever. Yeah. But um, first time I've gone to Australia with considerations to settle in some degree was in 2018. I think it was mid to eight, 2018 when I finished my high school. Yeah. I was here to study. Yeah. But uh, I didn't really think much about staying here long term. So so you um, enrolled, I think it was Monash, right? That is correct, yeah. Yeah, and you were doing, um, what, what, was, what was the degree? I was doing psychology. Yeah, psychology. And um, that didn't last long. No, I, guess we're, I guess we're both university dropouts in a way. It wasn't by choice either. I only chose psychology because my parents then thought that you know, I would be a doctor if it was... Ah, I see, I see. See, it's yeah. very important for your children to be doctors. Actually. Yes, yes, uh, very, very true. Yeah. Um, it's uh, another common factor, I think, is we've both <laughs> disappointed the, uh, the, the parents as well. Um, <laughs> so, so, Max, yeah. um, you, were, you were not very political growing up or when, when was your first kind of political type awakening when you were growing up? Yeah, right. I think in Hong Kong, at least for my age group, I think... Most people grew up with this sort of undertone of political happenings on yeah. the backdrop. Yeah, I think most people, even in primary schools, just from the uh, history textbooks and things like that, you get taught about Hong Kong's governmental system. Maybe mm. that's just me, but I've had friends that echoed the same views. But mm. yeah, so you hear about you know having an independent judicial system. You hear about having independent electoral systems, uh, supposedly. And, mm. you know, you feel like, you know, how is this place not an independent place? Like, how, is it, how is it not a country? You know, by all means, yeah. it's quite autonomous. And, you know, we don't speak the same language. Uh, we don't have the same culture. We don't have the same mannerisms and things like that. So, so, so up, uh, perhaps um, kind of expand on that. The differences in culture and language you think separate uh, Hong Kong from the mainland in China? Not in these times. I wouldn't say it's culture. I think yeah. to say that, all the differences root from culture alone, not the differences in culture alone. It's um, too simple or too quick an answer. Yeah. And to me, I think, you know, well, it's, a, it's an immigrant city, Hong Kong, right? or at least we want it to be. It's yeah. intended to be. And we get, you know, non-Han Hong Kongers, right? They don't worship the same religious uh, the folk gods. They don't worship the same folk gods as um, the Han Chinese population does. Does that make them less of a Hong Konger? I don't think so. So yeah. while in the past these things might have, you know, stirred up my imaginations of what Hong Kong is supposed to be and hence my political sort of awakening, which has yeah. always been there since, I guess, pre- oh, not preschool, but like primary school. Besides that, I think that uh, in these days, I would think that there's a more complex answer to that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when, when you were growing up, what was your hopes for future, for Hong Kong, for yourself? What, what did you hope for in the future yeah. for, for your city? And Yeah, for myself... I guess the first political awakening for someone born in the 2000s like me was 2014. It was yeah. pretty big. I was in the equivalent of grade 
eight. Yeah. And, um, you know, you see your high school seniors all getting out of class. You see them going to the Occupy zones in, during the Occupy movement, things yeah. like that. I remember going down there a couple of times. I remember some of my high school seniors going, so that urged me, you know. That sort of seeing all the, your seniors going definitely makes you want to go check it out. Yeah, well. yeah. But I wouldn't say it was like hardcore beliefs. I wouldn't say I would be lying if I said, you know, I went there, you know, expecting to fight and yeah, to die for my yeah, country. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. I wasn't thinking that. <laughs> yeah, because you're was, like 14 or. I was like 14. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Like, hey, that's pretty cool. You don't get school for two months. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. They're occupying the city, uh, the CBD. You don't get to go to school for two months. You know, it's pretty based. You yeah, know, yeah. You get an extended holiday. So that's sort of, I went <laughs> yeah, there. Yeah. With that sort of sentiment, eventually, yeah. when I was there, and the things after the rise of, you know, independence as an ideology, and other conflicts happening after twenty fourteen, that progressively built on it. So there are specific moments where I thought, hey, you know, this is the moment. While uh, this is the moment where I'm going to seriously get political, but um, before then, it was like a slow simmer. Yeah, interesting. So, so like, when do you feel? you first became kind of a supporter of Hong Kong independence. When did you feel like you first, like, gained a sense that you, you were, like, an opponent of the Chinese Communist Party? You, um, you wanted to oppose that, that regime. What, what kind of led you to that point? And, um, and yeah, what, what was your kind of... What was the, the kind of experience? Yeah. I think between now and when I had my first awakenings or my first times reading the news actually seriously yeah. and analyzing yeah. it, thinking about it. Yeah, there were a lot of breakthroughs to have. Like it could be my actions and my thoughts and these are independent breakthroughs. You know, there was not one time when I just gave up everything and then just started to do or started to get interested in politics. But yeah, in that sense, I guess one of the moments when I thought, you know, like you said, now I'm going to be a supporter of independence. Now I'm going to you know give my all for this was... I think it has to be really 2019. Yeah. It's before I've heard of it. Yeah. Before I have been sympathizers of it. Yeah. But um, I wouldn't say there wasn't a chance, but because I don't like to think that. But um, yeah. 2019 was a big chance to, for someone to get politically mobilized and get involved. Yeah. And for that, I, was like, uh, I felt like, you know, I feel like I have more autonomy over my own life. And I feel like, you know, if not now, when? Because during 2019 as yeah. well, there was a sentiment that you know that was the last battle or like yeah. that was the last great movement or at least the leaders have said it the leaders then have said it so yeah. it's like you know if it's going to be the last one anyway you know yeah. why why would i wait and i i suppose in a way it almost was the last one uh, i hope not i hope not too i hope not too yeah yeah but then, i mean it it was like the last one of a certain era for hong kong yeah i'd say so yeah yeah like I don't. I don't know. So you you were in you were in Monash University in Melbourne, twenty nineteen, and at what point did you think you know I've got to get involved? Because you, you actually went back to Hong Kong. Like, like yeah. Explain that process. Yeah, I went. I was in Hong Kong in the early days of June. I think I went. It's all very blurry for me, but I think I went back to Australia to continue my studies in July or like really late June. Yeah. Definitely after the 26th. Mm. And then, um, yeah, it was depressing. I was in Monash College. Not college, I mean, in one of the colleges in Monash. I'll start that over. So yeah. it was really depressing. I was stuck in one of the colleges in Monash. just the really old dorm rooms. Yeah. And uh, you get 20 people living on one floor with a couple of shared bathrooms. And my room was, you know, no bigger than my bedroom back home. Yeah. And I was just stuck there. Cause, um, and, and actually, that's, that's interesting. Like, this is a bit of a side note. But maybe we can talk a bit about the socioeconomic yeah. conditions in Hong Kong. Because I guess some of, the, some of the Chinese Communist Party supporters, they will say, oh, well, this is a, a, a movement for the privileged Hong Kongers who, who look down upon the mainland and, and it's a capitalist movement and it's, it's right-wing economically and they're all supporting capitalism and Big Bang, etc. Like, but one of the things that I think... A lot of people in Hong Kong um, who experience the movement firsthand, they would understand is, you know, the, t- the really tough socioeconomic conditions in Hong Kong and the inequality, were, th- these were factors that drove the uprising. So can you talk to us a bit about like the socioeconomic conditions in Hong Kong, wh- like whether you think that l- that played a part in the uprising? Wow. Okay. 
um, yeah, I think that was always there. You know, even yeah. in high school, you get taught about wealth inequalities. Yeah. And, you know, they actually admit, well, most people will say it is true. And even the textbooks admit that, you know, it is a very big problem in Hong Kong. It's an always existing kind of thing. But I'd say because of the way that the political vocabulary in Hong Kong is structured, you don't... Mm. Class struggle. You don't talk about class struggle. Yeah. You know, uh, but do I think it is a class struggle in hindsight? You know, I think if we look at if we look at it materialistically or in a material sense, I think it was a class struggle. Because yeah. It, it had the economy been better, or had the general social environment been better, like say twenty eighteen or before then. You know, twenty eighteen you get people from Hong Kong, young kids my age, yeah. going back to the mainland, going to Shenzhen and things like that. Yeah. The trips they get they do day trips there. Yeah. And they drink bubble tea and have Chinese food and things like that, have succulent yeah. Chinese meals. And then they just come back home and then um you know, think themselves Chinese. I think back in twenty eighteen it wasn't a problem it wasn't a problem, but yeah. Somehow in twenty nineteen it started becoming a problem. So it wasn't it's it must not be the only factor. Yeah, but, um, yeah. And another thing is... Because of- that, that's another factor. Like, some, sometimes you get people on the Hong Kong left who were, were trying Look, to say, this think, is only a class struggle. And- I think given the culture, like, the way, just the way people talk to each other and the language yeah. and things like that, the language used in Hong Kong, the culture in Hong Kong, because of that, for example, uh, insurance salesmen, right? They don't think yeah. of themselves as laborers, right? Yeah. There's a very... Well, most parents in Hong Kong teach their children to look down on laborers or trade jobs. You know, they think of it as a lower class. Yeah. And also racial inequalities is actually quite persistent. For example, yeah. they feel like Southeast Asian laborers are lesser than um, yeah. Han laborers. Or they yeah. don't say Han, but like Chinese yeah. laborers, things like that. So I feel like, although they don't recognize it, it's happening. So just because a bunch of white collar workers don't think yeah. it's class struggle, doesn't mean it is not class struggle. If they are arguing for, you know, better wages and better living conditions, yeah. it is a class thing. Yes. <laughs> and and I guess it was, it was very tied, tied, it's very much tied into that because one of the things that the Chinese Communist Party did when they took over, um, they, they sort of entrenched the local oligopolies in place, right? I mean, like they, they sort of co-opted the Hong Kong ruling class that had existed under the British and you know that that stayed consistent right like i mean that yeah. that ruling class power structure was was pretty yeah. Well, yeah 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 i would say so they are all guts in hong kong right yeah. you see lee ka shing things like that a lot of people worship them for their wealth and things yeah. like that but um is it really good for the city like i know a lot of people point to the oligarchs saying that oh homegrown oligarchs are better than chinese <laughs> oligarchs or oligarchs sent from the chinese communist party and it is the lost uh, the loss of hong kong homegrown domestic oligarchs that has led to the downfall of the city but that is you know, very depressing it to is very depressing yeah it's like cyberpunk bro <laughs> yeah like, you just you just, choo- you just choose be- between the mega calls yeah. yeah i don't like arasaka so you work for <laughs> the other one right yeah <laughs> it's like you just choose between cyberpunk beautiful. mega calls <laughs> base, like, that's base. the choice you get beautiful yeah so beautiful. that definitely i think that's also politically translated into like helplessness I, yeah. well, obviously it's just not Hong Kong it's all over the place but especially in Hong Kong a lot of people you know just say oh, oh well what can I do that's the yeah. thing that's, you yeah. know, whatever you ask them or oh, what can I do about it you know it's, it is what it is and things like that yeah yeah. so especially because I think from uh, day to day from day to day living downright to the most sort of political aspects of their lives you know they don't get to choose yeah yeah I think so that's interesting so it's just interesting, like, do you think the uprising, did it have an economic character to it? Do you think that, like, or would you say, in a sense, maybe the horizons it was, it was trying to imagine were potentially too limited? In, like, what do you think? Like, do you think the revolution in 2019 onwards, did it, did it deal with the socioeconomic conditions um, as, as much as it should have? I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to go on record and say it failed. Yeah. But it is definitely a big factor. For example, the general strikes. Yeah. Like yeah. They, had generals, they tried to do general strikes, but there were no labor organizations built enough and capable enough or determined enough to translate that into 
you know, political mobilizing. And yeah. it is good that political ma- mobilizing eventually grew out of Hong Kong and there was political mobilizing. Hell, you know, yeah. I, I know people and you know people and I, yeah, yeah. I was part of it. But um, yeah, I would say that, you know, they had to build new unions and all that in a rush. Yeah. And things like that. It wasn't prepared to tap into the economic grievances yeah. of the population. Yeah. It is very, for most people, I would say, obviously there are different sub-factions, factions, yeah, yeah. groups that think differently. Yeah. But I think for the general average particip- a participant, you know, they don't really think about that. Yeah. You know, we, we don't want the law. We want an independent judicial system. We don't want to get extradited. I yeah. think that was really just it for most people. Yeah, yeah. But uh, for me, not really. And I guess for a lot of people who really went the extra mile, or from from... I, from my personal account, right, and it's most definitely not the only account, most people that have gone the extra mile do not just operate on the very basic demands of no extradition. Yeah, of course. In judicial. You, no, have but, to, you yeah. have to find something else that's worth dying for. Yeah, no, of course. I mean, obviously there were sort of moderate sub-factions who just had this strict aim, no extradition yeah. treaty so with like China. So for, for, for economics, I feel like, as you said, it could have been tapped in more. Like, yeah. what good is a revolution if you can't promise people, you know, just bread? Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> you say, that's a good point. Yeah, if you, yeah. you know, what's the point of, you know, a revolution if you say, you know, oh, uh, not only are we not going to uh, change our system of government, it's going to be the same system of government with new people in it. Yeah. And uh, you're still going to get, you know, Get, pe- get underpaid and you'll still live in a cage. Yeah. Like, what, what? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, so you can't... I personally... I know some people yeah. do and I used to... Well, I used to think of it because those around me would think that... Um, I think a lot of Hong Kongers or some Hong Kongers would think that, you know, a lot of the working class peoples in Hong Kong weren't willing to come out and mm. help protest and that's right. That uh, That's why most... Protested or general protesters were generally white collar workers. You know their families. Right. So, so if if you're discussing kind of like a profile of the average participant, you'd say they middle were class. Mi- middle class. Yeah. Middle class families. Yeah. You right. Get people with baby trolleys going so, to rallies and things like that. Do do you th- do you reckon like you know if you were kind of looking at it from perspective of say like Marx, like it's kind of like bourgeois revolution or like a liberal revolution. I think. For the most part, generally, it is. Yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't... So, I, I, but that makes sense. So, I mean, even from a left-wing radical perspective, like, Marx didn't dismiss liberal and bourgeois revolutions because he thought, first, you have to overthrow feudalism. First, you have to, like, have the civil rights from which you can then build the basis for a proper working-class revolution. So, from even, like, the left-wing radical perspective, I mean, there's still a place for what was happening in Hong Kong. Yeah, look, I think I... My personal guideline is that... My, my personal principle is that I don't... I've, I rarely criticise what happened in the past. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, but if because I... Because it, it was amazingly inspiring. Like, I'm, I'm sitting oh, there... Oh, no doubt. No yeah. Doubt. Like, I was sitting there in 2019 and I was just was watching people my age, yeah. like, willing to fight and put their lives on the line yeah. and die in the streets for, a, you know, a different world. And that's inspirational yeah. to me. So... For me, the Hong Kong uprising, the revolution, yeah. that was pivotal, pivotal political moment in my yeah. development. Even if, you know, at this point in time, it's a very dark kind of... Well, it's for, a dark position well, right now for know, Hong Kong. As I said before, you know, 2019 is what really got me going yeah. down into the deep end. But then, um, yeah, I guess the thing is, you know, if you want... I think if hypothetically there was to be another one of these instances... Yeah. incidences. Um, I think if there was, it was to happen again, if it was to happen again, it would be better or it would be more effective to respond to the economic needs. Of I get, the yeah, yeah. Um, so, I, I don't know, how, how, would, how would you define your position in the Hong Kong movement? Because there would be people who, there'd be people who try and place you on the sort of like left of the Hong Kong movement. Like, do you think that's an accurate pers- perspective? Or do you think your camp, which, are, you know, is a localist camp, I believe, do you think that's just, you know, it just doesn't translate into those left-right sort of bu- political binaries that, you know, we understand in the West? Yeah, I tend to think that... So there's no actual camp, like, there's no membership. Yeah. There's yeah. no membership form you fill in. Yeah, of course. There's no fee to pay. 
you just sort of identify. Yeah. So um, I guess in that sense, for my leanings to its independence and direct action, yeah. I could be placed on the localist camp, but there is no actual application process. Like, yeah, it's not course. a formalized group. That said, I personally think, yeah, I think I'm more left-leaning Yeah. in terms of the way I look at it, the way I analyze it, and the way I sort of want would like to plan things further out. Yeah. I would be. And, and I, I think we both at times have unfortunately been like sort of attacked by other Hong... Like obviously you're, you're a Hong Konger. I'm not a Hong Konger. But like at times I was attacked by Hong Kongers saying like Drew is too socialist. He's, he's like betrayed the movement, blah, blah, blah. Too left wing. And I think you've encountered that type of attack and criticism in the past as well. So like what's your response to people saying like, oh, you know, he's on the left... Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I used to pay attention to them, but yeah. I actually pay them no heed anymore. Yeah. Because I've come to a realisation that they can't do anything. Well, I mean, what would you... How would you try to explain that? Because there was undeniably this sort of current in Hong Kong where, you know, you had those pictures of those guys who had the American flags and Trump and... Yeah. yeah. And all sorts of, like, how would you explain that movement? And how do you understand that kind of sub-faction that emerged? And perhaps that is the greatest problem with Hong Kong and the Hong Kong movements in general. There mm. was never a central ideology. Yeah, w- What is a Hong Kong ideology? It can be, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't matter, you know, is it socialist? Is it liberal? Is it, yeah. people try to brand them themselves, people try to brand themselves now, three years after, and they say, oh, I'm a classical liberal, yeah, or, yeah. Oh, I'm a socialist, things like that. But there was no, up till, I guess, re- in really, up till very, very recent times, there's never been a central ideology. Yeah. Like, it pains me to say, but there's no guideline, there's no plan of action. You just sort of on very, on very surface level things you care about. Like yeah, it's always the way I try to explain it is um, if you look at Hong Kong's movements besides twenty sixteen yeah. and twenty eight tw- uh, and uh, twenty seventeen, besides the localist uprisings, it's always been react a reaction. Yeah, to government policy. True. Like, yeah, they've, they've never. There was never no. There was never central ideology to drive the movements or the populace forwards towards a common True. goal or any yeah. goal. Right, I'm not saying there should be a common goal. So because of that, you know, it's tw- was 2019 reactionary, was 2019 socialist. It was both. It was everything. No, true. Look, maybe it's a bit like Euromaidan in a way because you know in Euromaidan you had these kind of like liberals who were supporting a future with the European Union. And these were like sort of the classical liberals, the social liberals. But you also had anarchists. You had far left fighting. You also had far right fighting. I feel like it was a bit of a popular front. Yeah, like that's yeah, I, I understand that. It but makes not, sense. Not united necessarily, but a popular front. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense because it was such like a kind of... It was a whole of society-wide mobilisation. Some of the mobilisation that took place in Hong Kong was just incredible. Like I still remember footage of just the massive human chains that form, you know, passing... Um, material up to the front line as passing bricks and stuff like that. It was just the, uh, the amazing way that literally tens of thousands, hundreds, hundreds of thousands, millions of people somehow spontaneously congregated and, you know, formed these political structures on the go, on the fly. It was just incredible. What, what would be your reaction to, and like another one that they try and hurl at the Hong Kong is like, they say, oh, well, like, you know, what about the Hong Kongers who were like racist towards the mainlanders and saying they're locusts and blah, blah, blah. Like, like what do you, how do, how do you respond to the people who try it? the kind of CCP propagandists who are trying to say like, well, it was, it was like based on this kind of like Hong Konger privileged, like hatred for the lower on the main, like that's how they try and present it sometimes. How do you respond to that kind of like CCP propaganda point? I think any criticism that is based off of painting Hong Kong in a broad brush is to be discarded. Because yeah. it was never, like I said, there was no central ideology. Yeah. You can get someone standing next to you that's an anarcho-communist and then another one that, you know, is a monarchist. Yeah, you know, the, yeah. It didn't, it didn't really matter while mm. you were out there. Yeah. And that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, so, it makes sense. So it that's why sense. automatically, like, for example, I see a really general argument on Twitter and uh, yeah. public platforms being used against the general Hong Kong movement. And it was all slander, it smears, you know. Well, yeah, for example... Some people will say, critics of the movements will say that um, Hong Kong is monarchist. Yeah. Like Hong Kong is... They, it's, they, it's they, like crave, they... they crave for British colonisation. Yeah. <laughs> but then it does exist. 
Yeah. There does exist but, a big sect of people like that. But does that mean that everybody out there hurling bricks yeah. and fighting for their lives are all monarchists? I can tell you resounding, yeah. resoundingly that that was not the case. It's, it's literal idiocy because it, it's like they can't identify that there are different sub-factions of, of an entire fucking huge movement that encompasses the entirety of society. Yeah. <laughs> it's so mixed up. Like it's such a big popular front with so many different yeah. people with different beliefs and things like that. You know, it's impossible to just do general broad stroke arguments against it. It's, it's really interesting the kind of commonalities between Ukraine and Hong Kong because I know a lot of Hong Kongers were inspired by the Euromaidan protests and the revolution there. And it's also almost similar in a way in that, you know, the Russians try and smear all of Ukrainians as Nazis because of like, you know, these small fringe subgroups, you know. And it's almost like they, the CCP propagandists do the same thing to Hong Kong. It's like there's a small subgroup here and there that have bad views. And then they go, oh, the entire Hong Kong protest movement is blah, 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 this, this, this. And yeah, it just... They just collapse down this whole complex thing into... They don't, well, they're not interested in understanding it. They just yeah. want to destroy it. And, you know, you can get it from critics. And I think generally a lot of people outside, from outside of Hong Kong, a lot of bystanders or, you know, viewers tend to think or they'd like to think that it was all one thing because it's nicer to think like that. Yeah, it's easier like, to think that. Like it's easier and it's nicer. You know, it's so it's just that, you know, some city in Asia, you know, decided to rise up against China in a, in a glorious united front and went out in a burning blaze. You know, that's, you know, that's the nicest way to talk about it. And that's what people t- generally try to think. So, and that's not only damaging yeah. to the movement itself, you know, it's damaging to the entire community, I feel. Because when you say that enough times, and when people, even, when people outside of Hong Kong say that enough times, yeah. it signals very clearly that nobody or even supporters of the course don't want to really get to know the movement. Yeah. You can get a supporter of the course, and I, I'm grateful that they are supporters of the course, but they can come up to you and they say, you know, oh, why do you not support the Queen? Oh. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I don't. Like, yeah, because yeah. that is not part of my ideology and that is not part of my principle. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but, yeah. but for them to somehow make a trader, they, they won't do that, but for them to somehow paint a traitor off me because, you know, I don't support, uh, I don't support the, the queen that his one Hong Kong friend does. Yeah, I mean... I think that is quite damaging. It, it's difficult, right? Because obviously in the West, there are like these actors who don't give a fuck really about Hong Kong and they latch onto it for their own end. So like, does Ted Cruz actually care about the lives of Hong Kong? It's like, like, would he care about the fact that there are coffin apartments in Hong Kong? No, he wouldn't really, at the end of the day. I mean, like, what? They, it, it wouldn't matter the type yeah. of regime. That... And it's not that I don't understand it. Like, of yeah. course, you know, I didn't expect these people or I didn't expect these you know, general supporters to you know, really dive deep into this yeah. and make this their life's mission and study it. You know, that <laughs> yeah. is a job for me, yeah. my community. Like, and I don't, yeah. I don't expect anyone to you know, just take up that burden for themselves. I appreciate if they do, but yeah. it's not something I expect of people. Yeah. yeah. But, but yeah, no, it, mu- it must be frustrating when like, you, know, you encounter, like, say, conservative Australia and they're like, you know, well, I used to live in Hong Kong and it was, it was beautiful under the queen. And, like, yeah. it, and I mean, it's just... I wouldn't blame yeah. them. Yeah, I I, blame yeah, them. exactly. I mean, <laughs> but I wouldn't say. Yeah, it's, it's tough. Say, I wouldn't say that exactly what I wanted to hear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, because I, I remember like th- there've been times where we've been like you know working together on certain projects and politic political campaigns and stuff, and like you know some like old conservative guy will come across and be like, ah oh, yes, you know my my fellow son of the British Empire, and like and you, like I just know for you because you're like kind of on the Hong Kong localist camp, like that you just fucking hate that, and I completely understand why, like <laughs> like yeah, it, it's certainly like this anachronism anachronism and it's it's kind of cringe when people in the like when some people in the west latched onto it because ah oh, it used to be a western colony like yeah. oh, it for me personally i've never thought like oh if only we could go back to like 1997 yeah, yeah, 1996 yeah. like it was shit under the british too yeah. oh, obviously obviously better than it is now Look, because you you did have more civil like more civil liberties and stuff like that but like but like it's not a solution to just go back like 20, 30 years, you know? Like... For, for the longest time, I've just proposed this question to myself and it's just an exercise that I yeah. do to myself. 
there's no re- there doesn't need to be an answer and there's really no answer to it but is it ever possible for Hong Kong to not be mentioned only by its relation to a master yeah or good to, point or to a or to a colonizer or to an occupier country like yeah. it's always been Hong Kong UK or Hong Kong China or even yeah. held during the second world war Hong Kong Japan right yeah yeah so there's never been Hong Kong Hong Kong or just neatly just Hong Kong right? yeah and no, I understand like, that. It, uh, yeah, so I guess that is also one of a primary motivator. Like, if nothing else, you know, it would just be, I would die a happy man if I would just have that question answered. Yeah, well, it's it's a tough one, right? Because, like, the reason why, like, there'll probably be people who listen to this and they go, like, how the fuck can Drew say that it was still bad under Britain? And, like, obviously, it's preferable to, obviously, like, you know, the situation back in the 90s is probably preferable than CCP rule. But at the same time, like, people don't realise, like, it wasn't a democracy in Hong Kong at that point. Like, people didn't choose the chief executive. People didn't choose who governed them, who ruled them. They still didn't have a say. Yes, yes, the civil liberties situation is in, infinitely pre- preferable to, the, to, like, fucking Gestapo Nazi state rule, of course. But, like... A friend of mine used to say this to me, and uh, that's a bit of a joke, but... Uh, he said, you know, yeah, as you said, you know, we had more freedoms, technically, and uh, the economy was better, but so was the world. You know, who wasn't rich during the 1980s, right? It was the economic boom. And yeah. all of Asia was getting a piece of it. You know, so, right, yeah. So it's, so it's so, sort of like a China argument. Like, China lifted millions of people out of poverty. But yeah. then, bro, like, the economy of the world was rising. Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's, it's true. Of, it sort of takes a really bad ruler to not write, write that wave. That's the first one. The other part of the conversation was... We all know that during British rule, it wasn't a democracy. And then during yeah. British rule, we couldn't even choose the chief executive, well, governor, and things like that. It well, was, no one's ever been able to choose yeah, the chief, yeah. chief executive. But Sadly, then, it's still obviously not the but case. But then the joke being, at least they were upfront about it. <laughs> <laughs> at, le- at least the British Empire called it, you know, the British colony in the uh, orange yeah. Hong Kong, <laughs> right? At least they called it a colony. I think it's... But Hong Kong doesn't... China doesn't. Well, now the special autonomy. Yeah, China doesn't yeah, yeah. call Hong Kong and <laughs> China doesn't call Hong Kong a colony. It says it's our, uh, it's uh, we are <laughs> our ties are thicker than blood. And, uh, <laughs> and, no, that's actually this yeah. Is can... This is an inseparable part of our ancestral lands and things like that. Yeah, we just happen because of historical circumstances to let you have autonomy. So I to that <laughs> yeah, yeah. to that I prefer upfront colonizers. That's a cheap good point. Yeah, because that's at least a good the point. battle lines are drawn. You know, yeah. I know who clearly. The enemies are, yeah. and I know who clearly the oppressors are. I know who clearly yeah. has control of me. I know who clearly are my brothers and sisters. And that's, so that's, that's a good it's... point. That's a good point because, like, it, it's still a colony today. But then they just, but then the propaganda is suffocating because they they say, you know, you are you are our blood relations, our blood ties. You know, it's all the blood and soil rhetoric. Yeah, so it's all under occupation, but at least some people were admitted. Yeah, and the <laughs> the, the, the current occupiers being China, they don't want to admit it. Yeah, because that is they want to naturalize the part of it. So <sighs> yeah, you know, Fuck. I would much prefer, like honestly, I would much prefer if they just called it Xiang uh, Gang uh, <laughs> Colony of China. <laughs> right? If they if they would just if they would just issue me a Chinese passport saying Colony of China Hong Kong, <laughs> or just whatever their Mandarin spelling of Hong Kong would be, that would be much preferred. Well, they've got good track record, right? Because like. <laughs> The Mandarin term for Tibet is like Western Treasure House, and like the the Mandarin term for Xinjiang is like the new borderland, the new frontier. Yeah. So like, if only like Hong Kong could just be like the bastion of the South, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like something like that. Because because then it would not be so hard, and it would not be so fucking confusing to just explain to people that yes, it is a colony. You don't have to go through six 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 rounds of mental gymnastics just to explain <laughs> how you know it is a colony we know it is it's yeah, just, yeah yeah it's just that it's not in the name yeah so, right? oh my god so i can just take the passport i can show someone and say oh uh, are you a chinese citizen yes it's a colony of china <laughs> yes right <laughs> and that would be yeah. much easier well this is the problem as well that uyghurs and tibetans face as well because you know they're not they they have to pretend as well that they're you know loyal Chinese subjects oh, and for sure. that have that have been part of the Chinese nation for 5,000 years. And yeah, and that's why they're trying so hard to cleanse their... It's a bit different, I think. I tend to think that the Uyghur struggle and the Tibetan struggle and the Hong Kong struggle is a bit different. Yeah, yeah. In the sense that they, have, uh, primary, they are arguing for a primary ethnic group to have self-determination. While in Hong Kong, I do, 
I do not believe that is the best course of action. Yeah. And, well, uh, you're more of a civic nationalist rather than... Yeah, yeah. it's really hard because eventually you do just go back to, you know, well, these people are mostly Chinese. Except, mm. well, and then it, it's not that you can't explain that away. Like the way I like to think of it, and I don't mean to go too deep into this podcast. The way the way I like to think of it is when they say you are Han, Han itself is a construct. Well, like, yes, yes, that so, is actually a historical fact. Yeah, so I, I would argue that, but you know, you just you, I just don't usually say this to the layman, right? Well, I, actually, it's interesting for the podcast, like because we we've talked about this at length, and I, I find it very interesting, and I I completely agree with your like sort of take on it, but like I mean. Look, at the end of the day, like, if they were trying to classify you, they'd say, oh, Max is Han Chinese or whatever. But, like, try ex- like, like, explain to me what you've said, how you, like, the Han itself is an ethnic construct. It is a nationalist construct. And, and now it's yeah. starting to sound like a Joe Rogan podcast. Yeah. <laughs> ancient history. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, bring that up. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, no. Even in the history books, they say it, and you can see it on the maps. Like Hong Kong, southern China, many parts of China that they call China proper, really, that yeah. itself is conquered lands. Yeah, it's like true. you go through, you go back five thousand years. Like the south was, especially as south as Hong Kong on the yeah, coast. Yeah. You know that was never Han. It was like they called themselves um, Yut people, which is as good as you know North Vietnam. Mm. And I think some people actually do say North Vietnam. Yeah, and. Um, it was a collection of tribes. It was a, con- uh, it was a collection of indigenous peoples. And sure. the Chinese emperor decided that he wanted to unify the place and basically rule coast to coast. And then he assembled an army and slaughtered all of them and made them Han. Yeah. And then it wasn't an overnight change either. Uh, he Through many marriage policies, they called it, they yeah. intermarried and things like that and yeah. tried to basically naturalize new parts of conquered land. And it is not yeah. like it hasn't happened before in the West. It's yeah, called, of course. This of is course. called colonization. Yes, you know, of course. Han of itself course. is a product of colonization. Yes, yes. So, and know, of course, it, it has happened in the West. Of course. <laughs> yes, like, of course. Like, uh, that is another thing because when I say Chinese colonization or ancient Chinese colonization, it is almost impossible for some to grasp. In Asia, China especially, it's always happened. Han itself, the race that they are trying to name brand into this, you know, super master race in China right now. That's what yeah. they're doing. I yeah, think. yeah. No, I yeah. agree with you. Yeah, so for that, um, I think the Han race itself, it's constructed. So, yeah. Like, was there a point in time in your life where, you know, you were like, I, I don't feel Han, I'm Han- Hong Kong instead. Like, yeah, yeah like, like what, what was the source of that belief, you think? Oh, uh, I think, weirdly enough, it had to do with, of course, China pushing that on me. Yeah, I think yeah. I think there was two. There's, there's the national construct, and then there's the race construct. I think there yeah. are so many constructs there. But for the national construct, it was very much in high school when they tried to push Mandarin onto us. Yeah, we had, mandat- we had mandatory Mandarin classes, and yeah. I just skipped them. Yeah. yeah, well, just just say you know we might have an average listener who doesn't understand the differences. Like, obviously, it's a massive conversation, but like, can you briefly explain how different these languages are? Like, because, because I remember like growing up and, um, we'd be taught like, you know, we would, we would learn about China in, in like grade four and stuff like that. And you'd go on Wikipedia and you'd be like, you'd read like, you know, what, are, what is the most spoken language in the world? And it's like Chinese. And then it doesn't even like break it up to like explain like, you know, all the massive regional differences where like they're not mutually intelligible. Like, yeah, yeah. like I, I wouldn't have realized that like Cantonese is a separate language when I was a kid learning about China. Yeah. They call it dialect. Yeah. Yeah, they yeah. like to call it dialect. <laughs> <laughs> dialect. But yeah. it's really dif- different languages. I would say so. And that's ju- it's not just for Cantonese. There are lots of different dialects that yeah. might as well be separate languages. Yeah. Yeah. What, what are some other dialects that may as well be separate? Well, languages? Hokkien is quite different. Yeah, Hokkien. A lot of Hokkien speakers in um, Taiwan. Yeah. yeah. Hakka. Hakka. Things like that. Yeah. yeah, so it's quite a few different indigenous yeah. or regional specific languages. So, so you have to study it as a foreign language in school, Mandarin. Mandarin. Oh, they don't call it foreign language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. state language, bro. State language. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so the, <laughs> learning the state language. And um, what other ways would they try and force the identity on you? Yeah, there's the state language classes, which is mandatory for every high school and primary school student. So in 12 years of education, I've had 10 years 
of mandatory state language class. Yeah. Most I skipped, but, you know, <laughs> I, the point stands. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then, uh, you also can get a fail in state language class. So it's actually not just like a side elective subject. It's actually quite important. You can't just fail it and then yeah. you go your separate ways. You know, it actually does make a dent. Yeah. Right? So um, I can, you can imagine that, you know, my report card had a dent in it. Uh, how, how, how would you respond to, to um, the CCP propagandists who will be listening to this and they'll go, the Western running dog, he wanted to learn English rather than the state language? For a very long time, actually, to make them yeah. even more mad, for a very long time, I refused to speak Mandarin because I felt like that was the language of the colonizers. <laughs> Because oh, it's the most active org- organize. Uh, it's the most active colonizers, right? Yeah, yeah. For a very long time, I would refuse to speak it. And, right. Yeah. And I would, you know, write because we they could read my script. I would just write. <laughs> I don't mind doing that. I just don't want to s- s- buy into because there was also a big movement in twenty twelve that precedes twenty fourteen. It's called yeah. the uh, national education, yeah, anti national right. education rally and protests. And uh, parents got it. Uh, parents came out, and teachers came out to protest. It was about China trying to push on a uh, national education program yeah. to get people to identify as Chinese, yeah, very explicitly. But they have sorted out another way to do it, which is Chinese history class. It is mandatory to do Chinese yeah. history, so you actually did two history classes in Hong Kong during high yeah. school. You do. History is just called history, which yeah. is history of the world. Yeah, yeah. And then you, all, you don't get Hong Kong history, you get Chinese history. Mm. And Chinese history teaches you about the dynasties, yeah. things like that. And it also tells you about how Hong Kong is an inseparable part of China. Yes, of course. And Less so before and even more now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They have really hammered that one home. Well, why do you think it is... Just, this is just a more generic question, but like, why do you think they're so obsessed with Hong Kong? Why do you think... Like, for them, Hong Kong must be a part of the Chinese nation or otherwise, you know, the Chinese nation is separated and destroyed. And Yeah, I, I read Kevin Carrico's great book. Yes, yes. And we're going to be interviewing him tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, Two Systems, Two Countries. And uh, it's sort of like that vicious cycle you talked about. Yeah. Like that cycle of aggression. Yeah. But it's another one, like, it's just almost like cycle of revenge. Or like, yeah. It is true that I think some, there was even television shows about it, like Hong, Chinese or mainlanders, they call them yeah. mainland immigrants or mainland people were generally seen in Hong Kong popular media as, you know, poorer, less educated, things like that, because well, it, was during, it was during Maoist times. Yeah. And um, a lot of them came down to work and then it's generally... Pre- it's portrayed in a bad light. Yeah. And I think that grudge never got away. Yeah. And I think that cycle builds till now where, mm. you know, mainlanders think that inherently Hong Kongers are full of themselves. A lot mm. of them are, but yeah. for that to turn into energy to then, oh, I must have Hong Kong. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like yeah. sort of, it's sort of like an uh, unrequited love, you know? <laughs> okay. No, no, it kind of makes sense. It's this weird psychological much thing. much tate in this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's fucking interesting. I mean, when you're talking about like... I, I couldn't have her back then. I have to have her now. Yeah, oh my like, God, like man. It's just really... this obsessive control over Yeah, her. yeah. Like, like you said, like, I remember some Chinese people saying, well, pro-China people saying, you know, oh, Shanghai is just good as Hong Kong. <laughs> I, I don't doubt that. Yeah. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. As a financial hub, I don't doubt yeah, that. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. how much business has China had? So why not yeah. just have Shanghai... Or hell, even build two of them mm. and then just leave Hong Kong the fuck alone. You know, they yeah. can't seem to do That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, just fucking trash the place. Yeah. If you fucking hate it so much, just don't have it. But, you know, I feel like... It's, it's, a, it's an interesting point. Like, some people have, have pointed out that in the, in the drive with, like, the national security law and just, just wiping out all the things that made Hong Kong distinctive in terms of civil liberties and, and press freedom and stuff like that, like, it, it's almost like a kind of case where it's like, if we can't have Hong Kong, we'll destroy it type thing. Yeah. yeah. Like it's, if I can't have it, nobody can. Yeah. It's almost wow. obsessive. Yeah. So I think there's a rational, some, a lot of people, especially, you know, pro, uh, other protest leaders, you know, and I don't doubt that is a factor. And I know for a fact that that is a factor. They say that you know, for economic reasons, Hong Kong is a strategic stronghold and that's why they must have Hong Kong. I don't doubt that there are rational reasons, but I think besides rational reasons, there are, 
if not an equal amount, then more so. Yeah. Of irrational reasons. Yeah, rational, insane, ideological reasons. Yeah. yeah, it makes sense. I mean, like, there were... There's those, like, graphs that show when Hong Kong was handed over. And even just, you know, like, handover. Like, I just this is a side point, but, like, holy shit, even just, like, the, the term handover. Yeah. It's like, where did the Hong Kongers have the decision? Like, just one colonial power hands it over to another. How's yeah. that fair? What's really funny is when I... F- well, what's really interesting, really, is when I started learning about the independence movement, I yeah. know of people that dig into the archives of uh, the newsrooms yeah. and things like that to study old newspapers. There was this guy, I forgot his full English name now, but it was Ma Man Fai in Cantonese. So Mr. Ma, right? Yeah. He was an educated son of a businessman in Hong Kong. Yeah. And uh, he lived during colonial times, British colonial times, during the handover. And while, uh, when the talks of handover happened, when the, talk, well, when the talks of handover started after Churchill, after the Second World War, yeah, yeah. he actually started the first lobby group inside the United Nations arguing for an independent Hong Kong. Yeah, it yeah. It actually started way back before the handover. Yeah. And then he actually, tr- he actually tried to negotiate you know, some way for Hong Kong to not only be autonomous, but yeah. be an independent nation. But, you know, obviously it didn't go into fruition. But, so for people to say, you know, independence is a young idea, the contemporary iteration of independence in the sense that it's so fleshed out. Yeah. The modern iteration of the independence ideology is fairly young, but the concept of independence itself has long existed, I would say. This other story I learned during school, actually. There was this governor called Mark Young, and uh, Mark Young was a British governor, and he ruled during... or well, not ruled, but he governed <laughs> during British... Uh, so Mark Young governed during the Japanese occupation. Hmm. So he saw the Christmas War and things like that. He hmm. saw the Japanese take over Hong Kong hmm. really swiftly. And he was put in an internment camp in Stanley, a suburb in Hong Kong. Yeah. And during that time, he had a lot to think about. He had a lot to you know, contemplate about his country, his empire, Hong Kong, Japan, all that. And when the war ended and you know, the Japanese left and Hong Kong was restored and given back to Britain. Yeah. When that happened, Mark Young came up with a plan. It was not the best of plans, but yeah. he was basically going to go from no democracy to full democracy. He yeah. was saying that within a term's time, you can vote for your own governor. Yeah. And you can have your own judicial system. And then before then, it was segregated as well. There was a history of segregation. Yeah. Like there were no Chinese or you know whites only areas or British only yeah. areas to live. Yeah. And then there were only appointment only positions which basically meant you know you have to be from the colonial office yeah but then he's basically saying well let's just look past all that you know after the japanese occupation you know we've all been through this together let's just fully democratize this place during one term yeah and then the plan was initially sort of looked at and then when the next governor came it got shot down completely and just rolled back yeah so there are many instances in history where hong kong could have gone on a route where it could have been independent by 2000, by the year yeah. 2000. It's very much possible, I think. Yeah. But then it's just that, you know, the timeline we live on didn't allow that to happen. Perhaps yeah. another day. This is, um, this is a more, this is a tougher question, right? So, you know, obviously before they cracked down on it, um, like the Tiananmen memorials in Hong Kong were really huge tradition and, and it was something that made Hong Kong really distinctive as one of the only places basically the only place under like CCP rule effectively like that could actually mark it. Um, as, as like an independence advocate, I suppose you, you feel that you don't really have a stake in whether China is a democracy or not, or you, or do you not, and do you not feel like you have like a stake in like wanting the CCP to be, over, to be overthrown, etc. or like, like, like how do you see the broader relationship with China? Like if there was a Hong Kong that was independent yeah. How would you see, like, the broader struggle in China, for example? I can go on forever. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, and, yeah. And this would buy... Oh, okay, so my first answer going down to that. Because I, I know, like, there have been Hong Kongers who feel like it's their responsibility. That was, like, one of the arguments, like, Hong Kong will democratise China. And, and I think we've talked about it before and you don't like that idea. I'm yeah. against that. Yeah, yeah. Because, okay, so the first one is the most generally accepted one because of the political situation in Hong Kong, a lot of pan-democrats or general, just basically old establishment 
liberal class like normal yeah liberal pro democracy legislators in their in the mainstream parties in their political parties I wouldn't even say mainstream in the monopolized parties the constitution says that Hong Kong is an inseparable part of China so they mm. do not deny that in the first place yeah and then many times when they try to say that Hong Kong can liberalize Hong, uh, China or Hong Kong should be the gateway to liberalize China yeah that is done out of a motive of personal rela- uh, personal reasons. Like mm. It comes from the motive for them to say that, to do that, is because they feel that they're ultimately Chinese. Mm. They should help liberate the motherland. And yeah. That is their sentiment. That, yeah. I think that motive, that motive alone is unacceptable to me, mm. I feel, in my political view. However, that is not to say that there can be no June 4th events or you know, any yeah. remembrances of that. Uh, localist camp way before me during 2016 had proposed that we can talk about June 4th and we should talk about June 4th, but not in relations that, oh, we have a duty. Uh, we, have a bo- uh, we have a duty since birth to yeah, liberate yeah. the motherland. But rather, you know, seeing that all these people got killed by its own government in the neighboring country, we can really just assure ourselves that there should be no deals to be made with this country. Look, I, I understand because there, there are like some Ukrainians who have very justifiably pushed back against the kind of notion that like Ukraine can be like the thing that finally, you know, overthrows the tyranny in Russia and brings democracy. And like, they're just suffering. They've just got people who are like literally being bombed to death right now. Like they can't have that view right now I think and you can understand that and like and I can understand how it can be a kind of oppressive kind of assumption to put on someone that it's your duty from birth to help over like you know liberate China etc um yeah go go on for you to feel that you have to first think that you're Chinese yeah and that is already opposed to the concept of an independent Hong Kong unless you want like a culturally Chinese bastion in the south that's just happens to be called Hong Kong. Like, that is a genuine argument that some have brought up. And I don't, you know, I don't <laughs> intend on fighting with them. But uh, yeah. that is just not my ideology. But yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I feel like, you know, June, what, what happened in June 4th is bad, it's sad. Yeah. And it should be talked about, it should be remembered. And uh, it's, it's not a... If anything, the dude, the, if anything, when you talk about June 4th, for me, the sense of duty should come from alerting your own people and community not to trust people not to trust the government of that neighboring country it's really just that intricacy like do you feel like Mm. you have to help liberate china because you're a part of them or do you feel like you can think just as easily because you know even if hong kong is independent uh china would still be our largest neighbor yeah so you know it makes sense that you would want to have a you know reasonably fair neighbor to negotiate with and deal with and deal with and that is why you want to support them or that is why you want to do something to push for democracy in the place that we call china proper yeah right so that can also be a motive and that to me is makes sense yeah so say hong kong becomes independent tomorrow it would still be in the benefit of asia really to have china or the world to have china become a liberal or not liberal but then it would still be in the benefit of the world for China to become a democracy. Yeah. Right? So I think on that point alone, it stands. But yeah. it, has not to, it has nothing to do with the blood tie, right? Yeah, of be, course. No blood. You can, you can be from whatever part of the world and you can still want to help June 4th because you feel like the dictatorship in China right now is applied onto you know, All the human humanity. conditions. Look, I understand that because yeah. obviously I've got no blood tie with China, but I feel very strongly that... Yeah. Just from the sense that all human beings in some way are ultimately connected in that, you know, there is a common human nature. There's something that links us together in common humanity. A crime against one human being is a crime against all. Yeah. In that sense, that's why I feel so strongly about it. Yeah, in that sense, yeah. in that sense, your motives is just as similar as mine. Yeah, like, there's I, I understand. No, there's no unspoken reason because I'm from that part of the world. I somehow feel Chinese and I feel like the motherland should be liberated. There's no underlying personal ties to that thing look that's interesting and maybe that is one of the reasons we ended up getting along so well and working together so much because i mean i think at the end of the day we both do want this same goal which is you know for the tyranny to be ended and overthrown and for you know freedom to reign but at the same time like neither of us are coming to it from the perspective of it's because it's our blood tie you know like like 
I feel it's just more of a... For me personally, I feel it's more just, you know, this is an interest I have as a human being rather than... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If I, there is yeah. to be... A, if there is to be an extra point on my end, it is that... It is... Uh, if there is to be an extra point on my end, it is that the Chinese government is the government that is actively colonizing my homeland. Yeah, true. And Good that point. is why yeah, of course. I would want everything terrible to happen to them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like no. that is, or I would want at least for them to become sensible enough to let the place go. Yeah, no, I'm, right? it makes so, sense. Um, oh, this, is, this is another interesting question. Um, so, like, what scope do you feel there is for you as a, as a Hong Konger independence advocate to work with like say Chinese pro democracy advocates, people who want to overthrow CCP tyranny, more generally, um, in say China proper. Like like, what scope do you feel there is for you to work with um, people from China? There's every scope to work. Yeah, with. I yeah. think. To me, working with Chinese democracy advocates, it is the same as working with, well, to like I mean on a personal level. Yeah. I don't feel any different from working with, Iranian. Democracy. Yeah, yeah, it's, no, that makes sense. So, you know, a place is being oppressed, terrible things are happening, there's tyranny, there's dictatorship, you want to help them yeah. you know, realize freedom. And yeah. you know, to me, you know, that is, that is that. You know, I do get some Chinese people, even ones that are pro democracy, who think that Hong Kong should be a part of China. Unfortunately, that, yeah, I've that, encountered and that. And that it must never be ceded and things yeah. like that. You know, um, this, is, this is unfortunately a reality where, like, I've encountered people who. I suppose are anti CCP. More generally, they'd be considered to be in the liberal camp in China, but they would they have no respect kind of for the Uyghurs or yeah. the Tibetans, and and they still have a kind of colonial mindset. And mm. this is a sad thing. You see this as well in Russia, where like even the so called liberal opposition in Russia, a lot of them can't even say like Crimea should be Ukrainian, etc. Yeah. Yeah. But but I am open to work with them. Of course, yeah, yeah. yeah of course. It's just that I'll always keep that in mind. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's interesting. It's interesting. Um. How would you respond to, you know, the claim that you're a terrorist, etc.? I mean, can you... Oh, gee, we got sidetracked by like an hour worth of ideological discussion. We could keep talking for so long about it. Um, but you, like, maybe, maybe explain, like, you, you go back to Hong Kong in 2019. And then like, how, what was your involvement? Like, what, what was the scope of your involvement? What did you see firsthand? And um, obviously, like, you, you, were, you were able to escape before the roundups got to you. Like, you, you can maybe explain to the listeners, like, how you managed to escape, what, you, what your involvement was, what you saw, how you managed to get out of Hong Kong, why you felt that you should continue the struggle further in diaspora rather than, say... Because, I mean, there are probably some people would say, oh, you know, just stay in Hong Kong forever, yeah. even gonna... if you're going to be imprisoned. Yeah. I'm going to need some more guiding questions because it's a bit too oh. big of a question. Yeah, but yeah, then, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I, then, I'll start it off. I'll start it off more no, like. No, but then I want to just start off and say. Yeah. Um, I did get out of Hong Kong, and uh, had I stayed longer, would have bad. Th- if I had stayed, if I had stayed longer in Hong Kong, would bad things have happened to me? Yes. I tend to think so. Yes. But then um. I think it's almost then, certain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. then um, there are people much worse off than me. Yeah. Like there, I know people. You know, at least I have all my body parts. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and uh, at least mentally, I'm not, uh, I'm not you know, bro- I've heard of people draining themselves in bathtubs, bro. Like, mm. draining um, should we put themselves. this draining? Bloodletting. Uh, or maybe I shouldn't put this in the podcast. I don't know. Oh, wow, wow, that's <laughs> uh, fucked. Yeah, so no, no. I would say I got out of Hong Kong complete. Like, I'm yeah. a whole person. Yeah. Both physically and mentally. Yeah. Relatively, anyway. And there yeah. are people much worse off than me. Yeah. So... You know, for me, there's always deeper to go, like in the Hong Kong movement. Yeah. Before and still, you know, there's always many more layers that you can go. Yeah. It's, it's true. only it's only ever a question of how much you can give. Yeah. And that is my. Well, clearly, that like there there were people who were like, I'm gonna stay, and basically martyr myself. Like there were yeah, people yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's always these. Things happening. So. But of course, you can't have that for everyone because someone's got to keep the fight going. Yeah, no, I just want to yeah. pay respect yeah, to that. Yeah, of course, of course. But then, um, yeah, yeah no, no, when absolutely. you ask what I was involved in, I would say, was I the most radical? Did I go to the most extreme? I would say no, because yeah. there would be more extremes that I know of that I haven't gone to. But then, um, 
And don't, <laughs> yeah. But then, um, yeah, I think as opposed to the general protest goer who attends at four because the poster says four and then leaves at six because the convener said so, I'm a fair bit, I've got yeah. a fair bit d- deeper than that. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because that, but then that is the general thing. Like most people, and it's not really just age. Uh, you can get high school kids and you can get you know, adults off work doing that. But uh, most people, you know, the poster says 4 p.m. They show up at 3.30. And then by 6, the convener says the rally's ended and they leave. Yeah. So, you know, that sort of is, that's my idea of a general participant. Yeah, yeah, true. And, uh, and you need them. You do need yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, of, yeah course, of course, of course. Yeah. So, you know, for that, I, I definitely am very appreciative of what yeah. everybody has done at every corner. Every every on the ground participant might Yeah, have. yeah. Like if I I don't mean to be too vengeful, but uh, some yeah. people, you know, they sit in air conditioned rooms and write articles. But then um <laughs> but uh yeah, no, uh, I tend to think that I've gone a fair bit deeper than yeah. the average protester. Yeah. I, I think I remember you explaining kind of the catalyst for you getting really directly personally involved. Yeah. Was like was basically losing a mate in the sense that the per the, the friend you had was physically scarred for life by the Hong Kong police force. Yeah, yeah. I know many people who were like that, but yeah. I personally had high school friends. Yeah. Well, high school yeah, I personally had high school friends whom I've known for twelve, thirteen years and they just don't respond to any texts for like months straight and turns out they had some grievous in- injuries happen to them. You know, yeah. I've seen someone with their it all, it's it's weird because whenever I talk about this and although the audience might not think so or even yeah. the interviewer, but sometimes it feels like bragging. I like, I don't wanna make it feel like, you know, oh I've seen this and this and this mm. and therefore I've seen more. It's not like that. But uh yeah. that sort of stuff that I've seen has definitely changed the way I behave myself. And what's weird is it's not just politically. I think it's just on every spectrum of the world. Like I in no like I don't intend and I've never tried to uh, cover this part up, but my life was comfortable yeah. before twenty nineteen. Like reasonably comfortable in the sense that, you know, I would not have had to really pay rent. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I I didn't have to worry about, you know, being able to eat and uh, because of that, you know, I could you know, like a normal person living in the modern world, you know, I would crave material things, but um, like I would want to have better food and I would not to like, I would prefer not to have shit food. Yeah, no, nice. like yeah, I get you. But all those experiences added up has changed my politics. Besides, it's also changed the way I behave myself, I think. Yeah. I think seeing that, seeing people, especially close friends, being really badly broken, both both mentally and physically, and, you know, the things I, I had to do back then. I can go into some stories later. But, yeah. you know, slowly I've just broken down everything that I ever cared about. Not yeah. that those are... And, you know, in hindsight, I don't think those are important things anyway. But, for example, you know, I don't care what I eat anymore. You know, yeah. it's fine. You know, living... I, I live in a place that... Oh, I lived in places that people would otherwise call squalor. Yeah. I don't really care. You know, I can work seven days a week, 24 yeah. hours, yeah. And, or 23 hours, I need an hour of sleep. But yeah. I have worked seven days a week and then on 12-hour shifts and things like that. Yeah. And, you know, that sort of thing doesn't bother me and things like that. It's like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. I don't mean to make it too retarded, but this, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, this, this uh, David, David Goggins bloke, have you, heard, have you seen him? Oh, fuck. I don't think so. Oh, no. never mind. Uh, no, so, well, no, what's, what's David Goggins? Oh, he's like this motivational speaker. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, that, well, that, that goes on Joe, Joe Rogan. Yeah. He goes, he goes stay hard all the time. Oh, I think I might know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. No, the point being, sidetracked, but uh, yeah. the point being, I've, uh, what otherwise people might have, uh, what people might otherwise think is pain, I think I've got, I've gotten to learn to love it. I understand. I understand because my life certainly got kind of fucked up. Yeah, like, 
people say, yeah. oh, you work seven days a week. I say, yes, I do. You know, that must be stressful. But yeah, at least I get to work and I'm not behind bars somewhere. Sure. Or I haven't sure. got some previous injury and I haven't, you know, I still got my hands. I haven't got fingers or nerves <sighs> missing. Sure. At least I fucking get to work. And that's I'm, what I'm grateful for. Yeah. You know, is this everything I want from life? Maybe. I don't know. Like, I, like, I don't want to... I'm not trying to um, sugarcoat this, but seriously, yeah. like because of what 2019 has showed me and what I've experienced, I literally, really, materially crave nothing. Interesting. I mean, tell us some of the things that just really, like, emotionally see you, like, at this time. You start from a personal account. I remember yeah. the first time I didn't sleep on a bed. Well, yeah. many times have happened, but usually that was out of my own volition like for example i wasn't um it was the f- first time where i had to sleep in sleep on the streets really yeah so um there's this one time this is this is one time there's the big state library in hong kong it's yeah. called central library and um it's this massive road well to Aust- compared to australia it's not yeah. so massive yeah but for hong kong you know three lane roads are a bit of a sight of to behold. So, yeah. so there was a four lane road. Yeah. And so it was, you know, regarded as a big road and it ran all over three suburbs. So, and um, yeah, I was there, there were big protests and things like that. And after the protests, the extremist actions happened. Extremist actions being? Yeah. Uh, well, I guess I can say this. Like, yeah. we really hated Starbucks because Starbucks yeah. were owned by Maxim's Holding Limited, I forgot the actual English name, but yeah. this company that's pro-China. So Starbucks, the Starbucks franchise is owned by one sole company yeah. in Hong Kong. So a lot of people went and burnt these shops down and went into, you know, not pillage, but then to just basically destroy it. And, uh, you know, that sort of stuff happened all along the road and things like that. Well, what did Chairman Mao say? Revolution's not a dinner party. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. It's not a coffee meat either. So, yeah. yeah. So we had to destroy them. And also, so basically, <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, we had to go there. Well, we didn't have to, but we did uh, yeah. go there and basically just wreak havoc along the road. And this would set some people off, eh? And, <laughs> and um, while that was happening, the cops surrounded us. Like, there were three suburbs. The library was here. There was a hill. And up the hill was nicer buildings and nicer apartments and things like that. There was a police station, I think, somewhere around there. And then the police were already spotted, you know, up around the hill. And then the cop cars just came crashing in. So we were caught in the pincer movement. Mm. And uh, everything was blocked. And then the riot gear, the riot police arrived. And then they were going to charge basically on two sides and basically hammer the protesters. And um, they, there was a bit of fighting. It wasn't the most intense, but, you know, just throwing things, running. And uh, many times when clashes happen, you get a bit of fighting in as well. Yeah. So that sort of back and forth happened a bit, and then they just closed in, and it was just going to compact all these people together. And um, a lot of people started running up the hill. And so I followed up the hill. By then, I was alone. Um, I ran up the hill and then only to find out that also the hilltop was already occupied by the police and they were uh, they were they were fully armed and geared you know patrolling the top of the hill and uh, I remember there was this not really a park but there was this really big tree on the hillside yeah and then there's this really big tree on the hillside and um, it, there was a bit of a I'm, I don't really know the name of the tree but then the roots of it was so thick that there was a V-shaped sort of crevice and uh, I took all of my stuff off, stashed it somewhere else. I think it was like a drainage hole or some shit. And then uh, I basically got my hoodie, covered myself, and I slept there. In the uh, crevice of a tree? In the crevice of a tree. But I didn't really yeah. sleep because I just heard cars coming back and forth and by and stuff like that. And I thought I was really lucky because they caught a lot of people that night. Yeah. So that was... And what would have happened if you got caught? I don't know. Well, like what, what happened to some of your Hong Kong friends who did get caught? Because I remember you telling me about how, yeah. so, like, brutal torture in, in the prison cell. Beaten. Beaten really viciously. Raped. Well, yeah, with even men. 
Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah a lot Raped of... with metal batons and things. Yeah, yeah. That's what you told me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that is stuff that I've heard and I tend to believe. And, uh, well, I've seen, the, you... I've seen the scarring and I don't, you know, I, don't, I don't know where else he would get a baton to mutilate, mutilate himself. Of yeah. course, you know, as, as with most critics that might see this video, you know, they would say, oh, maybe he did it to himself. You know, it's all hoax and things like that. Well, he, he could have. But I don't knowing those people. I don't think they 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 would have. Yeah. And so really, raped, beaten, things like that. Uh, I can talk about that story, and um, I know of a friend, and uh, that's sort of he's sort of why. I further de- dedicated myself into doing more, mm. and doing things that are deeper, uh, into the movement. Um. He was a long-term friend of mine, uh, 12 years, and you know, we were in high school together, we got up to some shit back in high school, we were just really good friends, right, my best mate, and um, I used to text him and call him once in a while, and we would, you know, just chat about normal stuff. When 2019 happened, I wasn't the most radical one immediately, but he's always been more political. Like mm. Back in 2014, he was the guy who, went to the protest more actively. He was the same age as me. Yeah. And uh, he taught me um, what he'd seen. He'd share what he'd seen. And he's always been more political. And to him, I've always been the guy that's less political. Yeah. Or the guy that doesn't really care. Right? So, um, f- I didn't know what he was up to. But I only know that he went out to the protests. But apparently, during the protest, early day, really early days of it, because that he was willing to fight, because that... He'd done it reasonably well. He'd been put in charge of more men. Well, more people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is that, a, is that a problem? If I use men or No, no, okay. I'm not going to fucking cancel you. Like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So, so he was put in charge of more men because uh, he was more capable and things like that. There wasn't really like an arm. It's another thing. Like, I'll go into this yeah. later. It's not a standard army. You don't get pensions. Yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> you don't, yeah. You, if you go into shit, you don't get helicopters to, as much as, you know, the people say the CIA backed this, you don't get people to helicopter you out of war zones. <laughs> like, if you're yeah. dead, you're dead. If yeah. you get caught, you're caught. Yeah. You know, if you have to, if you, if you have to pay for your sins, then you have to pay for your sins. Yeah. Like, you, that's what happened. Like, there's no backbone. There's nobody backing you. Well, there was no fucking CIA backing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like, well, unfortunately, like... <laughs> what you, but there is no... Like, there's no ranking system. Yeah, right? yeah. Right? There's no system to it, or at least in the early days. So, he eventually became a guy that was putting out the signals. So, mm. he would stand on a visible place and he would, you know, order things around and he had a megaphone on him. In the early days, again, he had just the filmsiest... Just work... Work helmet... Mm. Like a like a like a trade cap, like one of those yellow ones. It's despite what you know propaganda or pro democracy propaganda yeah. would portray. It's really fucking filmsy. Like you can have, in the cabinet, you can see one of the old ones. Yeah, and it's just you remember I showed you. Oh, the, we'll get it out for the podcast. Oh, I can do it later. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. We'll maybe for the next. Part. Yeah, yeah. So then I can come on here again. But then yeah. uh, the situation <laughs> is, uh, yeah, you've seen one, like. A baton hit can really, really just dent and crack it. Like yeah. those aren't designed for big blunt movements. It's for debris, bro. Yeah. Like, it's for dust and cigarette yeah, butts. Shit, yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fuck. yeah. So so anyways, the film's yes helmet and the cops by then they were already shooting tear gas canisters straight into crowd and they were aiming for people's torsos and heads. Like yeah. they were using like a gun. Yeah. Yeah. And it is fire and it is gunpowder gunpowder yeah. propelled. Yeah. It's gunpowder prepared. And um, so they were u- already using it like guns. They weren't shooting on the ground or anything like that. And um, so this guy, this, mac- uh, this friend of mine got shot in the head. Yeah. And then the helmet just shattered. Like it just completely shattered the thing. Shot in the head with a tear gas round and, yeah, and yeah, it yeah. shattered. And this is another thing. A lot of the news you don't hear. Like yeah. Especially about the protesters. Not, and then it can be about protesters and it can be about on their side as well. It can be about on their side as well. Like if a pro-government supporter or like a 
cop off duty gets beaten grievously, they don't really mention it. They have enough cases of sob stories for the police and things like that. But you know, not every story gets reported. That's what mm. that's that's what my point is. Yeah. You know, most people when you see them get exiled overseas, you know, their stories maybe ten two out of ten of them are recorded. Yeah. And the rest eight you just you know, you tend to believe because you have seen it happen. You think seen things like that yeah. happen. Back to the story, my friend got shot in the head, helmet shattered, and uh, it uh, basically put him in a shock. It's yeah. just his brain goes into shock, and he just flew down from the high place that he was standing, and then nobody knew what was happening. People were retreating in droves, and then I remember some first aid, uh, voluntary first aiders, medics, put them onto uh, uh, basically so so I remember that because uh, I wasn't there but um, what the recounted stories have told me was that um, he was then carried away by first aid voluntary medics yeah and uh, he was then shipped off to like the countryside to heal in this because people probably listening don't realise that Hong Kong has a countryside yeah uh, it does country. yeah it goes Hong Kong Island proper where the expats go yeah, then, the city. The yeah. city. And then it is uh, it is where I used to live. Yeah. It's not too hard to find out. Yeah. And then, uh, and then um, there's Kowloon Peninsula, Kowloon, which Kowloon is like Peninsula. the other side of the Victoria Harbour. Yeah. And then that is densely populated commercial districts and residential yeah. districts. And then you go further up, there's new territories. Yeah. You know, we didn't name them new territories. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the British did. Yeah. And then uh, it's just a swath. Uh, it's mostly... It resembles more than... Western city planning more. You get suburbs. Yeah. You get pockets of town, and then just greenery in between. Yeah. Because in Hong Kong, it's doesn't. It's not like that. In Hong yeah. Kong, island and Kowloon is just unending cityscape. Yeah. You yeah. just it just doesn't end. Yeah. And so when you go to new territories, there's more countryside to it. Yeah. And um, he got put onto the countryside, and I just haven't heard from him for a very long time. And uh, eventually, a mutual friend of ours said, "Oh, you know, he's really badly hit." really badly injured so he said uh, you should come see him sometime and I did you know a lot of it was because of him but there was other motivations as well because I really wanted by then you know I knew that whatever happened it wasn't good yeah. I didn't know about the helmet story back then but you know whatever whatever happened it can't be good so I was like it's weird like I felt a bit of patriotism yeah and this is another story as well but me and a couple of mates that were flying back to Hong Kong you know, we were waiting for the fight. Like, I remember re- watching, like, World War One documentaries about how young blokes go into fights yeah. because they th- have a romanticised feeling about it. Yeah. Like, no doubt, I think that was a really big factor in what, in what was in my mind. Yeah. I was like, I've got to serve my country. Like, back then, when it, whoever asked me, why are you going back? I really did just feel that. I, I can't explain why. I understand. It's this weird thing. Young blokes are susceptible to it. <laughs> and I, I've, I've felt it at times, you know, like, just, like, my stuff was m- on a much, much lesser scale, but, like, you know. Oh, no, no, I just... think there's no, comp- yeah, you but, can't really compare that. Yeah, but I, I guess it's just, like, you know, you you feel like you're fighting for a cause that's much greater than yourself. Yeah. There's a reason I s- to live. I saw it on, I, 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 in, in June, I had been, pro- I have been involved in some more extreme protests, although they weren't extreme extreme in the later yeah. sense like it got much more extreme later yeah but then um yeah you know i just felt like i had to serve the country and that on top of the story and me wanting to see the friend i went back and i met him and then he didn't smoke before which he now does apparently and then also his hands shock like his hands were shaking a lot yeah and his words were slurred yeah in the sense that you know, he couldn't really articulate articulate himself. Yeah. Like his mind was in a mess. So apparently what had happened was that he had, he never got it diagnosed or checked out because yeah. all the hospitals were already staked out by the police. Yes. Many instances. You can read this on the news. And they would detain protesters. Yeah, yeah. They would go into, because it's, you can really deduce what the guy's been up to by looking at their injuries, right? Yeah. Where, where the fuck else would they get a tear gas canister sized hit yeah. fracture on the head and things like that? So his skull would have been fractured 100%. I, I don't know. Yeah. I, there was no diagnosis. I saw yeah. him, I didn't touch his head or anything. Yeah, yeah. But then it was bandaged. 
right? And then so he had a lot of problems just articulating and just basic motor functions. And then he really wanted to go back to fight, but he couldn't. He was basically immobilized. So after some talk, you know, I would overgeneralize this and try to cut out the other sensitive parts. But then essentially what happened was he wanted to keep going, but he couldn't keep going. And then in our cohort back in high school, nobody was involved in this. There was like, what, four people mm. in the class of 80 or 100 that was involved in these extreme protests. Yeah. So he was like, oh, you know, oh, you've got to do it. So I did. I was going to do it even without him yeah. saying, but because of this and seeing this, it's gotten a lot more personal. Too. Yeah. So I, I think I so I think because of, the, of that, I was much more easily swayed and susceptible to new ideas, like yeah, more radical and extreme forms of protesting. Because you can't really find like just reading it on the news. It's not the same. It's not the same. Like it's when you've got a friend and like they've suffered directly yeah i mean it's bad like you will feel a lot and uh, i've seen on the screen that's why i go back it's like i see on the screen i see the city on fire i see the smoke in the city and you know i just want to go back and surf that's sort of what i felt initially yeah then after that i just felt like you know back then i would like to feel like you know this is what the worst can happen yeah maybe not death but this is what can happen yeah out there like if you go out it doesn't matter if you're like the best fighter, if you're the most careful or whatever, yeah. you know, it's just a matter of chance you can, this can happen to you. Yeah, they so, can f- smash your skull in. Yeah, yeah, but because of that, I felt like, you know, okay, so now I know, well, obviously after that, after that incident, I've since heard of other stories and I've other experiences that tells me otherwise. But back then I thought like, okay, so at least now I know what the worst thing is. If I can convince myself into accepting that fate, then I have nothing to worry about. Yeah. So that was really opening, eye-opening to me. Wow. And uh, that experience has led me to, you know, go really just straight, one uh, straight sharp angle into the uh, deepest end. Because usually for people, there's a bit of a gradual change. And I would say mine isn't instant either. Yeah. It's just a very steep curve. Yeah. Like I can, it was on a matter of days. I remember when I was back then, everything I was... I was learning so I was taking in so many new information and getting exposed to so many new experiences yeah. that I counted my days by hours and minutes. Like I barely had any sleep when I first get, got back. Not because I was stressed. Well, maybe I was, but I didn't get checked out. But not because of stress, but because so much was happening. Like tonight there was a protest. Tomorrow morning there will be one. And then tomorrow night there will be another one. Yeah. And then you would have, you know, th- operations happening all over. Uh, all over the cityscape and uh, yeah even just <laughs> traveling as well like back in well I was just a normal uni student 18 years old yeah and 19 well 19 years old um, even in Australia uh, live, uh, studying at Monash I wouldn't go free suburbs away yeah, from yeah, the campus because yeah. no, I just I had no car no driving yeah. license driver's license I wouldn't go travel so far and so I haven't seen all of Hong Kong despite my 18 years living there Yeah. so then I got to see it, the entirety of Hong Kong Yeah. I've been to every last I would like to think I've been to every last district in, yeah. the, in, the, in the city and uh, yeah so because of that you know I was always like on the edge yeah. and uh, yeah like that like there are smaller things like everybody smoked because yeah. you sort of have to wait for the police to charge. So what do you do? You smoke. And, and uh, so, um, you know, I picked up smoking and uh, other bad habits, things yeah. like that. But uh, besides that, you know, so many new things, many new things. It was the information overload has really, yeah, it's, some, it's a feeling that I've never had ever again. Yeah. Well, you're on the front lines I of don't a revolution. S- yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. It's kind of liberating. Like it's, yeah. I don't tr- I'm not trying to sound, sound too psychopathic. But it's not. It's like a form of absolute freedom to be fighting for a just cause against an evil enemy. Yeah. And I didn't, know, I didn't have to know what to do. Like every day, I just, it was planned out for me. Yeah. If there is a fight, I'll be there. Yeah, and it 
you don't you don't plan. Oh well, I wasn't when I first started off. I wasn't in the planning person, and I never got into like really deep planning. But you know, I was just like I knew I was disposable, and um, because of that, you know, it was really simple. Like I eat, I rest, and then I go do that, and then next hour I do this, next hour I do that. It's all very, despite not having an actual schedule, it was all very scheduled. Mm. Like for me. And uh, I remember me and some mates that I eventually started working with for these protests. Uh, every, and apparently everybody just developed this sort of tradition, but um, every time they would, every time we knew that something big was gonna go down, like maybe they were like, through the grapevines you hear about it and you're planning with your mates and you're planning with your group, your team, you're gonna go there, things like that. Or you get an order for some people, so for some people to get orders and they say, hey, you're gonna go there and do this, do that. Whenever it starts for me anyway, we used to go to uh, the cheapest restaurant or like just a regular, I just, we used to go to a restaurant uh, before the fight starts, like I say, three hours before, mm. and we used to just bulk yeah <laughs> not not for fighting purposes but yeah. uh it's really insane like to uh, me and my other friend we would order like a table like a this table we would <laughs> order a table full of dishes just seven dishes of just rice and noodles and then uh, we would scarf it all down and with completely clean we just scarf it all down and uh, because you know you go into that thinking that it's your last meal like if, if <sighs> sure, not, I get you if you're not dead you would be in jail like there's yeah, two situations true. you can be dead or you can be in jail or you could be grievously in- injured while yeah. in jail <laughs> yeah <laughs> I true because be, my friend got out lucky most people get grievously injured they don't get out and like the the the, the, the official narrative is that only like one person died in the Hong Kong protest, I don't believe that yeah I I know for a fact that that is not like you knew people that were killed yes and I've heard many other stories since yeah. and I Given the circumstances, given the... Well, there were bodies floating in Victoria Harbour. Well, killed is a... Well, it's like using the legal definitions of things. Yeah. If a guy was persuaded to jump off a building, was he killed? Yeah. Like, I don't want to go into specifics because I don't want to get anyone in trouble. But yeah. that is essentially... Or if someone was shoved or pushed off a building. Yeah. Well, yeah. that is murder. But yeah. Well... Well, yeah, but you can. It doesn't look like one. Yeah, look, they they did that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm it's, sure, like, uh, it's like it's like it's like in Russia where like an oligarch falls afoul of Putin and they fall out of a window. Yeah, happens all the time in Russia. It's so many suicides. Yeah, yeah. And they're the always so suspicious. Was, the suicide rate was skyrocketing during that time. Yeah, holy shit. Now, was it depression in the city? Maybe, but you know, was that all? I I don't. Uh, whenever I talk about this, I think of the critics and the uh, yeah, yeah and the uh, and the uh, Twitter warriors saying yeah. oh he's making shit up and things like yeah, that. Yeah, so, but, but they weren't there though. They weren't there. Yeah, but yeah, no. Um, yeah, we used to eat a lot and go in. Yeah, I know people used to drink a lot. And uh, to celebrate after and things like that. And so these sort of traditions popped up. It wasn't planned. People mm. just had the same idea. So it was, it was a really hard, because it, it flew by like nothing. 2019, 2020, 20, until 2021 when I came back to Australia. Like that, those two years flew by. I didn't even know, because I was counting the minutes, the hours so diligently. Hmm. Like I, I, it doesn't, the con, yeah, it's not a feeling I've had since. The construct of time felt different. Yeah. Yeah. And it's always the adrenaline. It's always just pumping you up. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. I, man, I can't even imagine going to battle with the Hong Kong police force. Yeah. So, um, no. Would I... But I would still a million times go back. Yeah. Like, I wouldn't take any decisions back. Yeah. I think it's changed me for the better. Yeah. Like on the most personal note. And I feel like it's opened me to things and ideas that I wouldn't have otherwise accepted. Yeah. Unless I've done that. Because in, in Hong Kong, everybody's so... Not everybody, but generally... Every, 
generally the city is sheltered. The populace is sheltered. Yeah. Like, you don't much hear about world news. You don't really need it to, you know, go by your daily life. People don't really talk about it. Like, it's not really a topic of discussion. You really just live and just consume <laughs> material. <laughs> like, yeah. it's really like cyber, again, cyberpunk. <laughs> yeah, cyberpunk. Holy <laughs> yeah, shit. Yeah, you, you live, consume. Yeah. For our soccer court. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, there's this, there's this um, slang called uh, eat, fuck, sleep. <laughs> it's the three things you do. Like, just what people do. And there's literally nothing else. And before it was really a place like that. Maybe it still is. I haven't been back. I've heard it is. I've heard that it's returning to that. But, uh, Damn, I can't even imagine those who stay behind and they're not political or whatever and they can just accept it. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I feel... Yeah. It's like slavery to me. And it's sad. Like, again... Uh, Spiritual slavery at the very least. It's very hard to equate that to... Uh, well, I don't... Let's not bring that into it. But then, yeah, no, it's... It, 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 uh, uh, there's a special place in my heart for people that were there. Yeah. And I feel an urge to, you know, help them or talk to them or care for them first. Yeah, like of course. No, that makes sense. Because even not like in Australia sometimes and overseas, in Hong Kong as well, like I know people that were really in the deep end, really just fighting tooth and nail, mm. having damages and things like that and uh, long-lasting mental damages and you know short-lasting or you know reasonably long-lasting physical injuries so anyway people that have been broken and yeah. when the protest ended they just you know what what do they do like they just go back to their lives yeah and wow. you see them you know working hospitals you know serving food uh washing mm. not that i think that they should be put on a pedestal and then worshipped and then they should have you know pension yeah not that I think that nor is it feasible but it pains me no to see that sometimes no like, it pain me that's hard yeah like yeah somehow during their teens or twenties they've decided to die for the thing yeah and live live a life that most live more in those years than most live in their entire lives and then, and then go live another life on top of that yeah where where they go back to civilian life it's crazy I think when it first started it was really hard I can share this story yes yeah. um, when I first came back to Australia I was I did attend lectures so uh, I went to um, I remember on my elective it's just an arts degree yeah and uh, I uh, on my electives I had media as an elective and then um, and I don't it's not that they were bad people right but uh, anyway there was this media professor was actually a nice person and then uh they talked about modern slavery and then beatings in asia and things like that that was the first lecture i went to incidentally yeah but uh i went there and uh i never went back to the lectures yeah. i don't know uh the the after like the after school talks after uni after class talks with the other students you know i saw other you know not Hong Kong students, but I saw other students that were chatting and then there were students that were nice to me and chatted to me, but I just couldn't. Some part of it, in, I, it took some getting used to. I think it's not so much a thing now, but it was like I had my ears blocked. Like, it was yeah. like, I just zoned out completely. No. And it is not voluntary. It's not like they were talking about boring stuff. It's yeah. not like they were boring people. And in no sense was I looking for a conversation. Like the last thing I was hoping for back then was another conversation about... Because yeah. I had just done the interviews and things like yeah, that. Because yeah. I just really wanted to take a break from that. So I went back yeah. to class. I didn't... It's not that I wanted to take a, talk about Hong Kong or the protests or the yeah. fights or what I'd done. But, you know, I was just trying to have a normal conversation. And then it, I just zoned out. I can't focus. Oh, man, it's hard. I, I remember... I completely struggled trying to get back into university after, um, after you know, they spent all that time trying to kick me out and, like, Chinese government had sent death threats to my family and all that. I just... It's so hard to get back into this, like, you know, coursework. Yeah. Like, Fuck. the life I have now, back then, it didn't feel real. Yeah. yeah. And that was really surreal. Yeah. I feel like in recent times, I've settled into myself. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, back then, it was weird. I wouldn't say bad, but really weird. Yeah. Yeah. 